It was only a matter of hours after the first plane hit the World Trade Center on 9-11 that we were told who to blame. I hope we do not compound this tragedy by reaching out to make accusations before the FBI and the CIA uh, inform us of what happened. That is exactly what happened, of course, uh, uh, after the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, the highest degree of uh, probability associated with this attack, which had remarkable coordination and logistical sophistication, would be Osama bin Laden's al-Qaeda group. In the studio. Oh, there we go. Ken. Ken is an international terrorism expert. Ken, good morning to you. Good afternoon to you. Excuse me. How are you, Matt? Uh, I'm fine, thank you. When, when you hear the U.S. officials saying they are already looking in the direction of Osama bin Laden, do you think they're looking in the right place? I think so. Matt, I mean, the sophistication of this attack, uh, the fact that it was elaborately planned. Um, you know, senior U.S. intelligence officials, or one senior U.S. intelligence official, uh, says now that the U.S. is 90% certain that bin Laden was responsible for mm -hmm. today's attack. Would you concur with that conclusion? I, I think that's a very good possibility. You have to look at who has the organization and who has the capability to do something like this. And, of course, uh, bin Laden's al-Qaeda organization uh, has to be right at the top of the list. Right now, suspicion focuses on Osama bin Laden. But first things first, the FBI is combing the wreckage for evidence and all U.S. military bases and embassies are at the highest state of alert. Now, we are told from sources earlier today that senior administration officials told key members of Congress that they are, quote, certain, based on the evidence they have gathered so far, confident, I'm sorry, not certain, confident, based on the evidence gathered so far, that people and organizations associated with Osama bin Laden are responsible for this. But coming out of the national security meeting tonight, I was told by a senior administration official they do not want to jump to conclusions here. The administration will say nothing publicly about that. This official saying, quote, we're going to take a little time to sort this out. So the president being briefed... Many of us in the Western world knew little or nothing about Osama bin Laden and his shadowy al-Qaeda terrorist network before watching the tragedy of September 11, 2001 unfold in real time on our television screens. Some had heard bin Laden's name before in connection with the financing of high-profile terrorist incidents, like the 1998 U.S. Embassy bombings in Africa or the bombing of the USS Cole in 2000. But a more detailed understanding of this man, his background, and the network of Islamist jihadists we are told he is directing remains largely the purview of South Asian scholars, counterterrorism experts, and government officials. Understandably, in the days and weeks following those horrific events, a traumatized public turned to these experts to make sense of what they had just witnessed. Very soon, a narrative began to emerge, one that seemed to explain what had happened and what it meant for the future of a world that, we were told, had changed forever. Tell us a bit about Osama bin Laden. Uh, what sort of resources and manpower and money he's got and what he's trying to achieve? What is Osama bin Laden? Is he a politician? Is he a warrior? Is he a preacher? A little of all? A little of all, I think, sir. He's a... a millionaire Saudi businessman believed to be living in exile in Afghanistan. He controls and finances Al-Qaeda, an umbrella network of Islamic militants. He is a... a a uh, very soft-spoken man, a man of, of eloquence. And he's vowed to destroy the United States. His network supports terrorists in Afghanistan, Bosnia, Chechnya, Somalia, Yemen, and Kosovo. Well, when I was in Afghanistan just a couple of days ago, uh, I, I heard that he had about 2,000 uh, volunteers working in his camps. Uh, Al-Qaeda that's receiving so much discussion and publicity uh, may have activities in 50 to 60 countries including the United States. Uh, Bernard Lewis has called him almost a poetic speaker of Arabic. U.S. officials link bin Laden to numerous terrorist attacks including the U.S. Embassy bombings in East Africa three years ago. Last year's bombing of the USS Cole in Yemen. One of the Millennium bombing plots. The last attack on the World Trade Center eight years ago. 
not a flamboyant individual, an individual who defers to his elders and to um, religious scholars. Osama bin Laden is a name that we have been hearing all day long as an individual who may, and we emphasize may, be responsible for these terrorist acts. They now believe that bin Laden was responsible. He's probably far away in the mountains now. He's got his own communication system, which the Americans can't apparently uh, chip into in any sense. There was constant discussion about him hiding out in caves, and I think many times the American people have a perception that it's a little hole dug out of a side of a mountain. Oh, no. This is it. This is a fortress. The tall, thin bin Laden's goal, in his own words, is to unite all Muslims and establish a government which follows Islamic law. Yes. A complex, multi-tiered, bedrooms and offices on the top, as you can see, secret exits on the side and, the end, and on the bottom. He's a very, very uh, significant figure in Islamic uh, politics, uh, certainly, and in world politics. It's a very sophisticated operation. Oh, you bet. This is serious business. And, and there's not one of those. There are many of those. He's clearly um, someone... What we must remember, though, is that this story, this understanding of our world, which was largely constructed for us in those first chaotic hours after the attacks, and which has remained largely unchanged to this day, only appears monolithic and unchallenged because it has been presented to us in a carefully constructed series of sound bites and interviews with official sources. The events of 9-11, like all major events in our 24-7 network news world, have become a mediated experience. We have been told how to understand these events by the same editors, executives, and media moguls that so obviously failed in their duties in the run-up to the war in Iraq. The truth is that the story of Al-Qaeda is much more complex than we have been led to believe. That Osama bin Laden is at best the dupe of Western intelligence forces and likely their collaborator. That he may in fact have died shortly after 9-11 and that his all-pervasive Al-Qaeda organization, with its alleged link to seemingly every terrorist incident in the world today, is in fact a media creation, a childlike simplification of a complex web of organizations led and populated by double agents and fictitious characters. The truth is that Al-Qaeda, as we have been led to understand it, does not exist. This documentary is the story of those pieces of information that call into question and ultimately destroy the Al-Qaeda myth. After all, for anyone who still believes that the government could tell no lie about a subject as important as this, we should remember that not even the Bush administration blames Osama bin Laden for the attacks of 9-11. So we've never made the case or argued the case that somehow Osama bin Laden was directly involved in 9-11. That evidence uh, has never been forthcoming. This is Big New Brzezinski. He was National Security Advisor to Jimmy Carter. He is currently a top foreign policy advisor to Barack Obama. He has proven to be an outstanding friend uh, and somebody who I've learned an immense amount from. And in 1979, he supervised a covert American intelligence operation to fund and train the Afghan Mujahideen that would form the base of Al-Qaeda. U.S. National Security Advisor Brzezinski flew to Pakistan to set about rallying resistance. He wanted to arm the Mujahideen without revealing America's role. On the Afghan border near the Khyber Pass, he urged the soldiers of God to redouble their efforts. We know of their deep belief in God, and we are confident that their struggle will succeed. 
Divei që mund të pëta shta, si taso hë musulmana një. That land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day, because your fight will prevail, and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again, because your cause is right, and God is on your side. The CIA involvement with the Afghan Mujahideen, including an estimated $3 to $20 billion of American taxpayer money that was spent by the U.S. to train and equip them, has been known and acknowledged for years. The operation was part of a Cold War gambit to bog down the Red Army in what was to become the Soviet Union's own Vietnam. An unending struggle to occupy a country against a determined and, thanks to the CIA, well-funded and trained guerrilla resistance. We must recognize the strategic importance of Afghanistan to stability and peace. A Soviet-occupied Afghanistan threatens both Iran and Pakistan and is a stepping stone to possible control over much of the world's oil supplies. The scheme, known as Operation Cyclone, was in fact an amazing success. The years of guerrilla fighting and thousands of deaths demoralized the Red Army, drained the resources of an already overstrained CCCP, and emboldened citizens in other Soviet satellites to throw off the yoke of communist repression. The Red Army retreated from Afghanistan in 1989, and the Soviet Union fell shortly thereafter. What is hardly ever acknowledged, however, is that the CIA involvement with the Mujahideen did not start after the Soviets entered Afghanistan, but before the invasion took place. This startling admission came directly from Brzezinski himself, who stated in a 1998 interview with a French periodical, According to the official version of history, CIA aid to the Mujahideen began during 1980, that is to say, after the Soviet army invaded Afghanistan, 24th of December 1979. But the reality, secretly guarded until now, is completely otherwise. Indeed, it was July 3rd, 1979, that President Carter signed the first directive for secret aid to the opponents of the pro-Soviet regime in Kabul. And that very day, I wrote a note to the president in which I explained to him that in my opinion this aid was going to induce a Soviet military intervention. This is an important point. What it means is that the CIA did not merely take a pre-existing movement of freedom fighters and aid them in their fight against the Soviets. What it means is that Western intelligence actively recruited Islamist extremists for the express purpose of provocateuring the Soviets into invading. By Brzezinski's own admission, if these Mujahideen had not been fostered by the CIA, the Soviets may never have invaded Afghanistan in the first place. In a very real sense then, Brzezinski and the US government fostered an extremist element of militant Islamists and helped form them into an effective fighting force. It was from the ranks of these Afghan Mujahideen that another group was to emerge composed mostly of so-called Arab Afghans or foreign fighters who came to Afghanistan to take up the jihad against the Soviets. The expulsion of the Soviets from Afghanistan was to be just the first of their battles and after the Red Army left their attention was to turn elsewhere. Of course, the geopolitics of the era required that the U.S. not be directly implicated in funding and trading the Mujahideen. Domestically, Americans would have been outraged had they been aware that they were footing the bill for training and equipping Islamic militants. And internationally, if the Soviets knew the extent of the CIA involvement in the region, it could have brought the two superpowers to the brink of World War III. Consequently, the training, arming, and funding of the Mujahideen was run through a series of fronts and compartmentalized 
so that not even those supposedly directing the operation knew its full extent. The official story is that U.S. funding, arms, and training went exclusively to the Afghanis, with the money for the foreign jihadists, or so-called Arab Afghans from which Al-Qaeda would spring, coming from the Saudis. The facts on the ground, however, tell a very different story. Within this group of Arab Afghans was an even smaller group centered around Osama bin Laden, a Saudi-born heir to the bin Laden family construction fortune. In Afghanistan in the late 1980s, his group consisted of about a dozen people. This group was known as Al-Qaeda, or so we are led to believe. Bin Laden himself claimed in his last authenticated interview in late 2001 that the name came from Abu Abeda al banashiri one of his accomplices in establishing the training camps in Afghanistan. Strange then that four years later, after the 7-7 bombings in London in 2005, Robin Cook, the former leader of the House of Parliament in the UK, would write an article for the London Guardian in which he claimed Al-Qaeda, in English, the base, literally referred to the database of Mujahideen who were being handled by the CIA in Afghanistan. Some researchers have even noted that Al-Qaeda is a slang term for the toilet in Arabic, hardly a name for a shadowy global terrorist organization. Regardless of how the group got its name, the fact is that this small group of militants were nurtured with the Afghan Mujahideen by the CIA at the behest of Zbigniew Brzezinski. There is evidence of direct U.S. involvement with Osama bin Laden and the hardline Arab militants in all three areas of Operation Cyclone, including funding, training, and arming the Arab Afghans. The startling truth, according to the sworn testimony of Michael Springman, an official at the Jeddah Consulate during this period, is that not only was the CIA providing training to bin Laden and his operatives, but that bin Laden was, in fact, a CIA asset, and the agency was rubber-stamping visas for his operatives to go to the U.S. for training. And I had been told that this was a visa scam, and it certainly seemed that way to me. I was told, look who needs the money. And the price, supposedly, for these visas was $2,500. And it was, you know, you know, the king's barber's servant uh, to get a visa. Uh, Frères was seen filling out visa applications for people in the consulate. Uh, it was just absolutely incomprehensible to me. And people I talked to who had been there uh, really didn't want to say much more about it. And it wasn't until I was out of the Foreign Service, when my appointment had been terminated for unspecified reasons, that I learned from three good sources. Joe Trento, the journalist, uh, a fellow attached to a university in Washington, D.C., and a guy with expert knowledge on the Middle East who had worked for a government agency. They said, it's very simple. The CIA and its asset, Osama bin Laden, were recruiting terrorists for the Afghan war. They were sending them to the United States for training, for rewards, for whatever purpose, and then sending them on to Afghanistan. And most likely, the problems they had with the liquor at the consulate, uh, large amounts of it disappearing, it being sold at very high markups, uh, and so forth, was being used to fund this. Perhaps not coincidentally, the U.S. consulate in Jeddah from which the CIA was smuggling operatives for bin Laden in the 80s, was the very consulate from which 11 of the 9-11 hijackers were to receive visas to enter the U.S., many of them using a special fast-track program called Visa Express, which only began four months before 9-11. Likewise, evidence links the CIA and bin Laden through arms sales, the suggestion that bin Laden was a customer for CIA arms has been repeated by Der Spiegel, BBC, and many other mainstream media sources, 
But in Simon Reeves' 1999 book, The New Jackals, one CIA source is quoted as saying that U.S. agents armed bin Laden's men by letting him pay rock-bottom prices for basic weapons. Incredibly, the funding for the Afghan operation also connects the U.S. to Osama. The U.S. provided the funding for the operation to the ISI, the Pakistani Inter-Services Intelligence, which worked closely with the CIA. In turn, the ISI, in cooperation with the CIA, distributed these funds to the Afghan Mujahideen through a front organization known as MAK, or the Bureau of Services. And one of the key men involved in arranging the finances of MAK, Osama bin Laden. After the Soviet withdrawal, Osama would take control of the organization and it would become the base of what we now know as Al-Qaeda. In fact, the CIA, through their Pakistani proxies in the ISI, not only funded armed and trained Osama bin Laden, but helped spur poppy cultivation to record levels in Afghanistan in an attempt to get the Soviet troops addicted to heroin. And they created the Taliban, the hardline fundamentalist group that would take control of Afghanistan after the Soviets withdrew. And the Taliban government would become the only government in the world willing to harbor Osama bin Laden from 1996 onwards. The simple fact is that US involvement in Afghanistan from 1979 onwards implicates them in the founding, funding and training of Osama bin Laden and other hardline militant Islamists. And as we shall see, the ties extend much further into the 90s and beyond. But what does Brzezinski, one of Obama's top advisors, think about this? Does he, in retrospect, admit the danger in having nurtured Al-Qaeda and the Taliban into existence? Does he regret American involvement in the region? In his 1998 interview with Le Nouvel Observateur, he stated, what is most important to the history of the world? The Taliban or the collapse of the Soviet Empire? Some stirred up Muslims or the liberation of Central Europe and the end of the Cold War?